This week, uh, during the news, in the e-news, I sent out a message that said that this message is going to be rated PG-13. So if you have any young children who you do not want to, uh, who are, do you think maybe is not ready for a PG-13 type message, uh, now would be the time to take them uh, elsewhere. Although I think that as parents, it's a, it's a good time for us to uh, use this time to teach our children and in, in, uh, things like that. This would also be another good time for me to mention the e-news that goes out uh, weekly. Uh, if, you, if you don't get that, put your uh, email address on the communication card. Uh, we send out a couple of email messages a week, uh, and it would keep you in the loop on that as well. And, and this week, as, we, as maybe you probably saw on the sign, we're going to be talking about sex, talking about sex and sexuality. And uh, this week, I, I probably had five or six different people say to me, again? <laughs> we're talking about sex again? It seems like we just talked about sex, and, and it's kind of funny because it was, it was back in September, which is five or six months ago now, when we did have a message about uh, sex and sexuality, and now uh, talking about it again, it, it kind of seems like for some people that, oh, here we go again. And I wonder about people on the road, right, and they, they've seen our sign, and the sign said something similar or maybe the exact same thing five or six months ago when we talked about this, and they probably think, there that church goes again. So all they want to talk about is sex. <laughs> and uh, I guess for some of us, maybe that's true. I don't know. I don't want to. Uh, but most of the time, we talk about Jesus. And Jesus talked about sex fairly often. Not only did Jesus talk about it, but, but also all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, sex and sexual, uh, sexuality and sexual immorality is talked about quite often. So it's important for us as a church to talk about these things even though they might be difficult. Uh, for most of us, we get this sex talk on a daily basis. Unfortunately, we get it from another perspective. We get it from the perspective of the world, the perspective that, that where we, we uh, turn on our television and the shows that we watch are all about sex and sexuality. Or maybe we uh, open up a book and the books that we read are about sex and sexuality. Or, or when we go to work, there's lots of jokes there's lots of talk about sex and sexuality, and so it's important for us as a body of believers, as a body of followers of Jesus, that we get together, and when we get together, we talk about some of the things that, that is talked about and things that are talked about daily in our culture, and one of them is sex. So I think this is very important. Uh, for those of you who are, are, haven't been with us uh, in a couple weeks or maybe you've missed out, we are looking at 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And we're calling this Christian life. It's like the game of life for Christians. And we have our, our, our board logo there. And we have our, our game spinner. And you can see that our game spinner landed on, on sexuality this week. So we're going to be talking about sexuality. So open them up to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul, as he, as he begins talking about sex and sexuality, is actually playing off of or continuing sort of a thought on what we talked about a little bit last week. Last week we talked about church discipline. There was an issue in the church at Corinth where there was a, a, some sexual immorality going on. And the, the Christians there at Corinth were allowing it to happen. They were, they were arrogant in their pride. They were proud of themselves and arrogant in their pride of themselves for allowing this sexual immorality to go on. If you remember, just real quickly, I'll look at the verse that Paul started off talking about. That was in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. And Paul writes, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans for a man has his father's wife. So there was a young man who was having sex with his stepmom. And this sexual immorality was going on in the church and they were allowing this to happen. And, and Paul begins his discussion on discipline there, on what should happen when this type of sin or any type of sin is allowed to go on in the church and we talked about discipline last week and so Paul continues this thought on on sexual immorality and we're gonna pick it up here in first Corinthians chapter 6 but before we do we need to define the term what is sexual immorality I imagine we could ask a hundred people and we would get about 95 different responses if we were to go around and say what is sexual immorality different people would answer this question differently. And the issue is important because people ask this question often. Now, they may not say what is sexual immorality, but what people want to know is what are the boundaries? Especially as Christians, as a Christian, 
How far can I go? If this is the line, I want to get close, right? I maybe don't want to cross over, but I want to get as close as I can possibly get without crossing that line. So most people as Christians will say, what's the boundaries? How far can I go? What can I do? What can I not do? At what point am I towing that line and I, you know, let me know before I go over? So in studying Scripture and reading what other people have said and, and looking at Scripture it, holistically, Old Testament and New, I believe sexual immorality as defined by Scripture is this. It's any sexual activity other than sex between a married man and a married woman. Any sexual activity other than sex between a married man and a married woman that are married together. Let me clarify. To married to each other. Because I guess we could take that anyway. And so that's how I believe Scripture defines sexual um, immorality. Any sexual activity outside of that between a married man and his wife or a married woman and her husband is sexual immorality. Now, our culture defines it differently, right? Our culture defines sexual immorality. Uh, and, and actually, our culture's definition of sexual immorality is actually kind of hard to nail down. Because if we were to go around to, through our culture and say, what is sexual immorality? Most people would say, well, rape, and rightly so. Most people would say pedophilia, you know, that's, that, that falls in the boundaries of, of what's sexually immoral, and, and rightfully so. But once you get past those things, it's kind, of, it's kind of open to each person's own interpretation. And so somebody might say, well, you know, adultery is, is sexually immoral. And some people might say, well, yeah, but maybe it's not. It depends on the situation. So in our culture, sexual immorality is much more difficult to define. Most Christians will say, okay, what about this? What about this specific activity? Can I do this? Or what about that? Or, or if this is the line, if sexual immorality, sex between a man and a woman, is the line, how close can I get to the line without going over? What do I need to do? And so the answer that I would say, Scripture gives us, if you're not married, don't do it. That's the line. If you're not married, don't do it. And both the church, the, the, the big C church, the church universal, and and the church here at, in, in its local form, in its local body here at Snowbill Christian Church, we must not waver on this. We must not bend toward public opinion because public opinion bends and swifts and turns and, and moves. But as a church and a body of Christ, we have to stand firm on the Word of God. We can't move. And unfortunately, the church, and in most places, they compare themselves to the world. And they'll say, okay, the world standards are right here. And as a church, ours are right here. So we're doing pretty good. As long as we're better morally than the world, we're doing pretty good. But what happens is, when the world standards fall, the churches often fall with it. And so we must maintain the unwavering standards of God. And not bend, especially, not just on sexual immorality, but since we're talking about this morning, we must not bend on the unwavering standards as it relates to sexual immorality. We must remain loving and gracious too. This is one of the keys, I think, for, for Christians in our culture, in a culture that is um, just inundated with sex. As Christians, we must remain loving and gracious to those who aren't Christians. We should not expect someone who's not a follower of Christ to live by the sexual standards of God. And so when we find someone who's not a Christian and we find out that they're uh, living in, in, in open sexual relationships or they're, they're, they're living in a homosexual relationship, as Christians we must not condemn. It's not our place. We must love and embrace and teach God's standards for good. So, so easy for, for us as Christians to point the finger and say, that's wrong, that's sin, you shouldn't be doing that. But what it comes across as, as people who aren't followers of Christ, it comes across as unloving. And so I, as Christians, my prayer is for this body of Christ that we would not be a people who is viewed as, as condemning and standing on God's word as a way to, to hammer the truth at people, but as a, as a group of people who are loving but have a different view when it comes to sexual morality.
I, I, my prayer would be that if we find someone who's not a Christian, who's, who's living a, a lifestyle that, that we believe Scripture would define as sexually immoral, that they would say, yeah, I know those people at Snellville Christian Church. And I disagree with them. But they love me and I appreciate that. And so that would be my prayer for us as it, comes, as it relates to people who are outside of Christ when it comes to sexual immorality. One of the things that we have to be careful about and what happens in society is that we decide, we try to decide and define what's right or wrong. We try to say, okay, this is right, I see this is right or this is wrong, and we, defi- we try to be the one who decides what's, what's right or wrong. That's how our culture uh, gets its standards. But God will not be involved in an open relationship. As followers of Christ, we are in a covenant relationship with God, and God is a jealous God. And He will not be involved in an open relationship with us. And when we say, I know what's right and I know what's wrong, we're committing idolatry. Or when we say, I know that the the society in which I live, they know what's right or what's wrong, and I'm going to follow their standards, we're committing idolatry. We're putting ourselves, we're putting the society standards in the place of God. And God is a jealous God and will not be involved in an open relationship where we are idolizing someone or something else. So, as we get started, what about sex? So what about sex? I, we, last night we were, I was together with a few people and, and I wanted to, to emphasize that this message is not a how-to message. If you came hoping to take lots of notes on how-to this is not what this is about. You know, there's lots of resources for that. I'm, you know, not, in this setting, I am not one of them. Now, if you want to talk to me afterwards, men, I will be glad to talk to you. Ladies, please talk to your mom or somebody else who knows better than me. This is not a how-to message. This is a message on the standards of God and, and, and the standard of, of God as it relates to sexual morality. So what about sex? Sex is a beautiful gift from God. It was created by God and for God and for His purposes. It was created to be an illustration of intimacy. God uses sex to show us what a a true closeness and oneness is all about. And it's a picture of, as, as a man and a woman, as a husband and wife get together in a sexual relationship, it's a picture of our relationship as Christians to God. Sin distorts that, though. What God intended for good, sin has distorted. Sin distorts our thoughts. When we have thoughts and and our thoughts are uh, around ideas of sexual immorality, sin distorts that. Sin distorts our desires as it relates to sexual immorality. As we begin getting involved in sexual sin, sin distorts our desires. Sin distorts our emotions. Sin distorts our actions. And sin takes what God has made beautiful to glorify Him, and it makes it ugly. Sin distorts. And we see this distortion every single day, most of us. If you turn on your television, if you watch a movie, if you read a book, and it doesn't have to be a book like Fifty Shades of Grey. It can be romance novels or lots of different books, lots of different TV shows, lots of different movies. They make jokes or make light of sexual immorality. And making light of sexual immorality begins to dull our senses. And we actually lower our standards to the culture's standards or just slightly above. Where we say, yeah, we might laugh at it, but at least we don't participate in it. And the church's standards become lower. Ephesians 5.3, Paul writes this. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. That is, as is proper among saints. Paul says, you're not even to talk about this kind of stuff. Certainly not laugh about it or make light of it. This is a serious issue. So how can we engage in movies and television and music that depict sexual immorality as something that's normal and good or funny? It's difficult. But Paul says, don't even have it on your lips. So what about sex? Let's look at what Paul has to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we'll start in verse 12. 
Paul writes this, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. And Paul is actually kind of quoting some, some cultural saying here. All things are lawful for me, the Corinthian church would have said. It's not a big deal. It's not illegal. Well, what Paul's saying here is that just because it's legal doesn't make it all right. It certainly doesn't make it good. And just because the church at Corinth allowed it doesn't make it right either. As we saw in chapter 5, they allowed some pretty serious sin to continue. And doesn't our society go by these same standards? I mean, if it's not illegal, it's not a big deal. If it's not illegal, whatever that person does in his house or in his bedroom or, or in, in her own spare time, whatever you do in your own time is, is your deal. That's what our society says. And Paul says that's the exact same idea that they had going on in, in the church at Corinth. All things are lawful for me. The world bases its morality on culture. But Christians, as we've talked about over and over through this series, Christians must be different. We have to live by the standard that God set, not to make us better people. Morality is based on who God is, not on the laws of the land. Morality is based on who God is, not on the laws of the land. And so they were having this issue in Corinth, and we have this issue today. If it's not illegal, it must be okay, right? And Paul would say, no. Just because it's elite, not illegal doesn't make it okay. Certainly doesn't make it good. Look at verse 13. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. This kind of, kind of sounds funny as we're talking about sexual immorality. And all of a sudden Paul throws in something about food. But the idea is appetite. In their, in their eyes, this, uh, this the, the sexual immorality or sex was the same thing as food. It was just a, a human appetite. And so they were equating sex with, with eating. If you get hungry, what do you do? You go get something to eat, right? You open your refrigerator or, you know, order pizza like what we do at our house. Or, you know, if you get hungry, you, you get you something to eat. Well, well in Corinth, and, and it's the same way in America, if you have a, a sexual desire, you, 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 you take care of it. You, you release that. And, and Paul is saying, no, it's, it's not like that. It's different. It's more than that. The body is meant not for sexual immorality. The body is meant for God. The Creator is the one who decides what the created were created for. And it's not the other way around. Our bodies were created for the Lord. Look at verse 14. Paul writes, and if God raised the Lord, and, or sorry, and God raised the Lord and will raise us up by his power. So Paul's saying, look, our bodies are, are going to be everlasting. They, they kind of had this idea that what you do in the flesh, a lot of people did, not just the church in Corinth at that time. And a lot of people today, what you do in your body doesn't really matter because we're, you know, our spirits are what count, right? Because we're, you know, if, we're, if you're a really spiritual person... Uh, then, then you're, you're good in what you do with your flesh. That doesn't really matter. But Paul's saying, no, the opposite of that is true. Just like God raised Jesus from the dead, we're going to be raised to, to life. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole huge chapter that discusses the, the resurrection of our bodies. And we'll actually get to that in, in this series on Christian life. And, and Paul says that your bodies are going to be raised from the dead. And, and on Judgment Day, we're going to have to give an account of what we do in our bodies or what we did in our bodies. Our bodies are important. Our bodies are valuable. This body that we have, we live with for, for eternity. God raises it and makes it new and, and wonderful and perfect, but, but the body you have will, will stay with you. And so what we do today in our bodies matters. They're not here today and gone tomorrow. They, what we do in our bodies matters. Look at verse 15. Paul writes, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. This is interesting here because Paul says sex is, is more than an activity. Sex is more than just meeting physical needs. Sex is more than just, you know, entertainment. 
And I think our culture is hung up on this idea of, of sex just being this, this physical thing, you know. Uh, you know, you have your friends with benefits, you just give them a call and you take care of your business and then, and then you move on. But Paul's saying sex is so much more than that. In sex, it joins people together on a deeper level than we ever think or could think of was possible. There's more that's going on in sex than just two people getting together. There's a oneness there. A oneness that, 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 that Paul in the next verse actually goes back to Genesis chapter 2. As God created them male and female so that they could come together and become one flesh. And because of this oneness uh, of sex and in, 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 in sexual immorality and because of a Christian's oneness with, with Christ... Paul says that when you combine sexual immorality with a Christian, you're combining Christ with a prostitute, or Christ with sexual immorality. There's a, there's a deep connection there, and that cannot go on. Sexual immorality connects through the body of a believer, Christ with sin. And Paul says that can't happen. There's more than what's going on here than just physical pleasure. And this thing cannot go on in the church. Look at verse 16 and 17. Paul says, Or do you not know that who, he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. That's going back to Genesis chapter 2. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. There's, there's this idea of, of, of more than just fulfilling a sexual appetite. There's a oneness that takes place, a deep intimate union that takes place during sex. And this doesn't just apply to the body because we are both physical and spiritual. We're connected to God uh, both physically and spiritually. And through our bodies we're connecting in sin when we engage in sexual immorality. And so there's spiritual ramifications and physical ramifications as well. And so Paul is basically giving the Corinthians and he would be giving us two options here. He said, option one, either you choose God and you stay away from sexual immorality or you choose the prostitute or whatever sexual immorality you're involved in. Either you choose God or you choose sexual immorality, but you can't have both. Because God can't be connected with sin. And when we are engaged in sexual immorality, we become one with sin. So what's the answer? What's the answer? How do we deal with sexual immorality? Well, here's Paul's answer. Paul says, flee sexual immorality. Run away. Get away from it. Look at verse 18. Paul says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Reminds me of, of, of Joseph in Genesis. I don't know how many of you remember the story of Joseph. And Joseph was sold into slavery and he became a, a, a servant of Potiphar. And he was doing a good job. And Potiphar's wife saw Joseph. He was young and handsome and she was physically attracted to him. And, and Potiphar's wife kept begging him to come to bed with her. And he wouldn't do it. Well, one day she, she just decides that she's just going to grab him. And she grabs him by the, the shirt and he goes running out of there. Joseph was fleeing sexual immorality and that picture ought to be what we have in our minds when we come into contact with this temptation of sexual immorality Paul says flee from it get away as fast as you can sexual immorality destroys families it destroys individuals it destroys communities it creates a oneness with with us and sin and sexual sin is, is different. This question is, you know, how, what does it mean when Paul writes sin against the body? What is this idea of sexual sin sinning against the body? I mean, there are lots of sins that we could think about that, that affect our body, like alcohol. If we, if we get drunk with alcohol, if we're alcoholics, that, that, that sin affects our body. How is this one different? Paul says this, this one is the one that affects your body differently. And the reason this affects us differently is because sin uniquely creates a oneness with, with bodies, with our bodies. And because of our oneness with Christ as Christians, sexual immorality is uniquely harmful in that it unites what's sacred with what's sinful. And that what, that's what 
Paul talks about here in these next two verses. Look at 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. Imagine the idea for, for a Jewish person. And, and God's temple was built, Solomon built this. And God's temple was the house of, the, of God. The presence of the Lord was in the temple. And so the temple was the house of the holy. And so imagine this idea of, of bringing a prostitute in to, 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 to be involved in sexual immorality in the temple. To the Jewish person, this would be unthinkable. How can you unite what's holy with what's immoral? How can you unite what's holy with sexual immorality? And so Paul draws on this to, to tell us that as Christians, we are the temple of God. So in sexual immorality, we're involving what's holy, God's temple, with what's sinful. We're, in, we're involving what's pure, what's holy, with what's immoral. And Paul says, we, this cannot happen. This, these things do not go together. We don't have the luxury to do whatever it is we want to do with our bodies. As Christians, we were bought. You are not your own. We belong to someone else. Through the death of Jesus, we were purchased. And so we're not our own. We can't say, it's my body, I'll do with it what I want. As Christians, it's not your body. That's what Paul says when you were, you were purchased with a price. We are property of God. Because we were bought through love and grace, we honor God with our bodies. Flee from sexual immorality. And that's hard, right? Because that's a desire of ours. Sex is a desire. So I would encourage you this. If you're not married and you desire sex, get married. And you may say, well, wait a minute. I, you know, I've, I still got to save up for, for my, my wedding. And I still got to make sure this happens. And we got to make sure we have enough. I, forget that. You're never going to have enough money anyway. Get married. <laughs> At least you're, you're taking away that temptation to sin. Flee sexual immorality. Get away from it in any way possible. And if you've already been sexually immoral, if you've already been involved in sexual immorality, then, then repent of your sin. That means turn away from it. Never to go back. This is incredibly serious. This is incredibly serious because, because unrepentant sin whether it be sexual immorality or, or any other sin, unrepentant sin condemns you to hell. This is serious. Flee from it. And this is Paul's entire point. If you look back, we skipped part of verse, chapter 6. Look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Paul says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Unrepentant sin condemns you to hell. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so here are some of the things that he says leads to unrighteousness. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, none of those will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's Paul's entire point here. Flee sexual immorality. But look at verse 11. And such were some of you. And I could go through here and Paul's talking to the Corinthians, but I could look at you and me and I could say, yeah, I fall into more than one of those categories. Paul says, such were some of you but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Praise God for grace. Because not just such were some of you, such were all of us. And through the grace of God, He sent Jesus 
Christianity is the only faith that God came to restore us. He doesn't ask you to be sexually, sexually moral so that you can meet some standard. He doesn't ask you not to be a deceiver so you can meet some standard of goodness. God came to earth because He knew we couldn't meet those standards. He sent Jesus to die on the cross so that His blood could cover us. So if you're involved in, have been involved in sexual immorality or any of these other categories, if you're apart, separated from God, then I pray that today you would look to His grace, look to Jesus on the cross. In a moment, we're going to sing a song of invitation. You guys can come on up and get ready for that. And I would like to encourage any of you, whether, you're, whether your sin is sexual immorality or or other, I would encourage you, if you've not given yourself to trusting and following Jesus, if you've not been covered in the grace of God through Christ, then I would encourage you to come and confess your need for Him today. To be baptized in His name. Repent of your sin. Trust in Jesus and His grace. Your life will be changed. You'll be one of the ones that Paul called washed, sanctified, justified, right standing in God's eyes. For some of you, it would be difficult to do that in front of a group. We would love you to do it in front of a group. It encourages our people. But if you can't do that, you don't have to do that. Come see me. See one of your Christian friends, one of our leaders here. We would love to tell you about trusting in Jesus for salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. You created us. You made us. You know what's right for us. Lord, help us to flee sexual immorality. Help us to do what's right with our bodies for your glory. Lord, it's hard. But you know what's right. You can see the end. I pray you help us see it as well. Lord, if there's anyone here who hasn't given their life to trusting and following in you, then I pray that today they would do that so that you can wash them in the blood of Jesus so that their life can be saved in the day of judgment so that they, their sins can be removed so they can wear that spotless white robe covered in Christ. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.